I go to the cinema a lot, and it's still like my first place that I want to see a movie. Like, and you know, don't get me wrong, I've watched like hundreds of movies at home in the last 18 months. But as soon as cinemas reopened in the UK, I went to see a film on the big screen that I owned a copy of at home. I don't want to stay home for the rest of my life. So, pandemic or not, it's like there's just the simple act of getting out of the house and seeing friends and going to the movies is a big part of my life. You wrote a note to social media and to audiences asking people to keep the surprises a surprise for Last Night in Soho. But my question is, how in the internet age do we keep things a secret? How do you expect that to happen? I mean, you know, you just have to kind of appeal to people's better nature. I'd seen that, like, um, Quentin Tarantino had done that at Cannes with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and... Bong Joon-ho had done it with Parasite, and Emerald Fennell had done it with Promising Young, Young Woman. And I felt that people, for, you know, pretty much played ball. I mean, I actually went to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood at the cinema two months after I can without knowing what the ending was. So it's, you know. For me, Last Night in Soho is really about nostalgia. And you think, oh, these were the good old days and everything was better back then. And I think the point of the film was like, hey, it wasn't always that great. <laughs> and we don't need to go backwards for comfort. <laughs> It's sort of in the 60s, there are a lot of dramas about kind of women coming to the big city and having the audacity to want to do well yeah. and being sort of roundly punished for, for, for that. And I always thought that was kind of, like that was interesting. Most of those films are written by men and there seemed to be something kind of almost like a, a wrist slap for sort of, you know, women's liberation. So that was sort of part of the idea is what if you actually sort of had a character that wants to go back to the 60s and then starts to sort of experience a narrative that isn't quite as glamorous as she would like. We were always trying to work out how much time to spend in the 60s. And for me, you know, the film is about a young girl becoming obsessed with this woman that she sees. And I like I've done that I, many actors and actresses and you see them and you're just like, I wish I could be their best friend. For women, it's not just about looks. It's not just about kind of like how they move across the room. It's how they act, how they are and what they go after, their dreams. That, that's what I find like attractive in, in women. And so I think having that audition scene allowed Ellie to just watch Sandy and be like, my God, a goddess. Linger on the sidewalks where the neon signs are pretty. How can you lose? What was the first song that you selected for this film? I've been thinking about this film for like a decade. And in a way, like the song started to become post-it notes for me. It's like a playlist called Soho, five stars. And uh, the cover of Wade in the Water by the Graham Bond organization, which is the song that they dance to, whenever I would hear that song, I would kind of like visualize the scene, like having kind of like a movie version of Synesthesia. Actually, the audition scene was not in the original outline. And Christy suggested having this extra scene, which became the audition scene. And as soon as we started talking about it, I said, she's just singing Downtown by Petrita Clark. So it's kind of like I had this like long list of like, these are the songs, especially because of the nature of the story, um, having all of the female singers of the time, Dusty Springfield, Sandy Shaw, Cilla Black, Petula Clark was really important. They're really like melancholic in a way. They're sort of like, even like Downtown, which is sort of like sort of pretty upbeat song. There's like a hint of sadness in there. And that's something that's kind of key to the tone of the movie. You had Dame Diana Rigg in this film. She, as we know, is just a, a legend, an icon, Emma Peel herself. So what made her perfect for Soho? It just, you know, the idea of working with her was like so kind of like thrilling. And it's, it's really sort of become the big takeaway of the movie for me because she's no longer with us. And like, so it's, it, it was already poignant making the movie on a number of levels. And now her passing and having got to work with her and, and just being so fortunate to sort of get to know her in the last few years of her life. I mean, actually, like when we were introducing last night, I didn't, I sort of realized it was a year ago that she had passed away when we had the screen last night. And then that's why I sort of quickly walked off stage is because I think, oh, I, I'm, I'm going to cry. I can't talk about Diana Rigg much longer without. So I thought, I'm going to just wrap this up and walk off stage. <laughs> and so Cameron Bailey was like, where are you going? <laughs> I said, sorry, I was, I, was, I, was, I was about to stop.
properly blubbing. So, but it, she's just an amazing person and like somebody who kind of walks on the set and just everybody has to raise their game, you know. My favorite moment with her is actually when we were developing the script and we were doing like the final production pass and she took us for drinks and she drank me under the table. And I'm a Scottish person, I can drink. But like, she was just like Aperol spritz after Aperol spritz. And eventually we were so drunk. I mean, you were still, you know, compass mentis, but I was like, I'll write anything you want. <laughs> you want more lines, I'll write them. But yeah, that was, uh, to, to have a drink with Emma Peel was like a dream come true.